Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Out and Equal 2018 Virtual Summit Series. This is Isabel Borras, Out and Equal University Director. This is a one-hour broadcast audio call, so please make sure you've turned on the speakers or headphones and turned your volume up. If you have any trouble uh, dialing in, please use the phone number that's listed here or chat in and we will help you. Chat in on the left-hand side. As usual, we will be recording this session and it along with the slide deck will be available for you after the call. Before we begin today's conversation, I want to share a few announcements. So the virtual summit series continues next month with leaders from Northwestern's mutual for Northwestern Mutual's LGBTA ERG sharing tactical steps that allies can use to support, advocate, speak out, and stand up sassy, invisible allyship for their LGBTQ plus colleagues as told from a bisexual and straight perspective. That's on March 15th. On March 14th, the day before, our global webinar series continues with UN initiatives to advance LGBT equality in the private sector. I'm also very excited to announce that our 2018 summit kickoff call is scheduled for March 22nd. The call will provide uh, planning details for your team, key dates and locations, discuss the workshop proposal process, Audi Awards nominations, details on registration and housing, and what exciting new things you can expect at Summit in Seattle this year. Whether this is your first or 12th summit, this call will provide you with tools um, to create a value-added experience. And so certainly hope you can join us for all of these webinars, and we'll be sending out invitations to them shortly. As always, please feel free to email university at outandequal.org with any questions about our webinars or any of our other resources. I also want to invite you and your colleagues to our Building Bridges training in Jackson, Mississippi on March 8th. You can find more details including the specific address for and, and hours for the event on our website at outandequal.org slash Jackson Training. I'll share that link with you all shortly. But as part of our efforts to support LGBTQ workplace equality in the South, We'll be in Jackson to discuss issues impacting the community and to provide some education and tools to create inclusive workplace climate. So if you're anywhere close to Jackson, we absolutely invite you to join us. Otherwise, ask that you share this invitation with your contacts and colleagues uh, close to Jackson, Mississippi. A final announcement before we move on to today's exciting topic is our, uh, we'll be wrapping up our busy March with the Momentum Gala celebration. And so this is on March 29th here in San Francisco, and it'll feature top entertainment and inspirational speakers. We're thrilled to uh, announce the special appearances by Ana Navarro, Anthony Rapp, Frenchie Davis, and Clorox CEO Ben O'Dorer. Our fabulous host, Scott Nevins from Bravo's hit TV show, The People's Couch, is returning to lead us in festivities, and tickets are now available on our website, so highly encourage you to check that out as well. With that, those were fast announcements, I want to turn to today's virtual summit. Uh, Pride, create a symphony between your ERG and marketing team. As we all know, Pride Month is one of the best times to engage large numbers of LGBT consumers. But what is the value for a company to showcase products and services to LGBT consumers if they don't believe the company really cares about the community. Conversely, how can you showcase yourself as an employer of choice and engage your employees when consumer messaging is absent or unprofessionally executed? How can a brand extend the pride message beyond a weekend parade or festival? So to answer these questions, I'm pleased to introduce Comcast, NBC Universal, and Imri, who will share how they are bringing marketers and ERGs together to execute holistic pride initiatives that lift brands and corporate profiles. And so this is the abstract from a highly successful workshop at last year's summit. And I'm so pleased to introduce Kristen Weigel, Director of Production at Comcast NBC Universal, Derek Tarza, Director of Software Development, also at Comcast NBC Universal, another colleague, Mike Perone, Manager of Marketing Development at Comcast NBC Universal, and Joe Keenan, Director of LGBTQ and Entertainment at Emory Marketing. And with that, I will turn it over to our panelists. Welcome. Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Kristen Weigel, uh, and I work with NBC Entertainment here at Comcast NBC Universal. I wanted to give you a little uh, background on Comcast NBC Universal, um, which this company is incredibly dedicated to diversity and inclusion. We are a family company, and everybody is supported like family. 
our employee resource groups have a huge presence in the company. Uh, just to give you some insight on that, out at NBC Universal has been around since 1986, and out at Comcast has been around since 2011. Uh, we, are, we are ultimately a business, so our ERGs follow the 4C model of bringing our events and communication back to commerce, culture, community, and career. So this model helps us to make a business sense for all of our pride activations. Um, and now Joe will give a little background on Emory. Joe, did we lose yeah. you? I, I'm back. I'm back. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Kristen, and thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, my name is Joe Keenan. I'm the Executive Director of the, of the LGBTQ and Entertainment Practice Groups uh, with Emory. And as familiar as you all are with Comcast and NBC Universal and their wonderful properties, I'm guessing you may uh, not have heard of Emory before, so just a quick introduction. Uh, we work across a number of sectors from pharmaceutical to durable goods, retail, sports, entertainment, and much more. In regards to the LGBT space, we're able to cut across all the verticals and use our expertise to help brands navigate, connect with, and leverage the LGBTQ and allied segment. And as we like to say on the next slide, we're fiercely independent. Um, we are an LGBTQ owned and certified diverse supplier with the NGLCC. From a capabilities perspective, we're a fully integrated marketing communications firm with a focus on social, digital, and content. We've got an incredible team of strategists and creators, and in the LGBTQ practice, we get to have a lot of fun during Pride season every year. So I wanted to take a quick look at kind of what's going on with, it, with everything happening in the world. This is a, a chart from our friends over at Community Marketing who do a, a tremendous amount of research that they publish. Um, including an annual report, a report on the LGBTQ community. This is from their report least, released in the spring of 2017. What we see here is that the community is taking notice to brands and companies that are supportive now more than ever before. That top line, corporations that support LGBT equality are more important than ever, 88%. That's a huge number if you think about that. This adds to the other studies that reinforce the growing trend of consumers responding to brands that are supportive and wanting to spend monies spend their monies with companies that share their values. So this is not just um, marketing to LGBTQ folks in a silo, but that much wider population of the allies and those who are part of what we refer to as the equality audience. So it's really recognizing that these messages resonate far beyond just the LGBT audience that you see. On the next slide, you know, we talk about pride in particular. We take a look at pride in particular. This is part of their study, so this, was, this, this poll was taken after the election in 20. Um, 2016 um, in early 2017. So if you were to talk to some folks in the community a few years ago about pride, there was a little bit of a why do we need pride sense? Aren't we equal now? Didn't we succeed? Haven't we already won the battle? All of those ideas that, that maybe some thought that pride was starting to wane a little bit. So they asked this question, and you, know, you can tell between the two years that influx, that, that increase in the number of people that say that they're going to participate and that find the value in that. So this speaks to a huge opportunity for brands, um, and it, it starts to uh, help. Uh, hopefully, it help, helps to start um, helps you to start to understand and be able to articulate the business case for reaching out to the LGBTQ segment, supporting the community, and attracting not only those who identify as LGBT, LGBTQ, but again, that overall equality audience. Hi guys, this is Derek Tarza with Comcast, uh, Director of Software Development, but also um, my gay job, I like to say, is um, you know, the um, out at Comcast, which is our ERG on the National Liaison. I work with all of our field chapters. But you know, really, why is Pride so important to Comcast NBC Universal? Really, we, we want to show to the community that we are employer of choice, right? Um, also, internally, we want to show to all of our employees that we support the LGBT and ally community within. Uh, we want to be the face of inclusion. We showed our customers that we support each and every one of our customers, but also it, it, it is really a really good platform to show you know, external marketing messages like our Love is Love campaign or even talking about some of our, our content that is geared towards the LGBTQ community. 
So, you know, again, going back to that business case that we just started to touch on, first and foremost, Pride really is a public-facing marketing opportunity. From an ERG perspective, as soon as you elevate from being, you know, an internal happy hour, something in the office, something just for your members, um, you've invited the public to come along for the ride. And that's, that's an important consideration to really remember. Uh, the key word here is opportunity. It's the chance to connect with the segment, not just advertise to the segment. It's a, a chance to really engage them on a number of different levels. I'm guessing that most of you on the call have been to at least one Pride Festival, a parade, an event, or, or something Pride-related in some sort. For many LGBTQ people, as, as you probably know, Pride is special. It's a time to really celebrate who you are and celebrate those around you. You know, I, I tend to think that there's this sense of ownership of, to the specialness of it all. It's something that's really core to the community. So in a sense, Pride is like the community having a big backyard gathering, and certainly the invitation is there for brands to come, but you'd never want to show up in a way that isn't culturally competent and understanding who the audience is. And you definitely don't want to be the guy that makes the music stop when something, you know, with some inappropriate entrance that nobody wants to see. So it's important to recognize the two main audiences that Derek mentioned. It's the internal employees and team members as well as the external customers um, and make sure that you know, both are addressed equally in the Pride Plan. Yeah, Joe, that's, that's right. And you can see here in the pictures, this is one of the, uh, the, the Pride Fest that we worked, but we, we had a booth set up here in um, Philadelphia where you know, we had some of our ERG members you know, you know, talking to customers and, and Pride goers about you know, some of our, our products and services and, and our ERG. Um, you know, we handed out, you know, hats and, and shirts and things like that, but talked to us about the products of the voice and the home security and just engaging, engaging the, um, the, the community, which was great. Great. So hi, everybody. Uh, this is Mike Perone. I am the Manager of Marketing Development at E! Entertainment at Comcast NBC Universal. Uh, one of the things that I would uh, like to talk about to everybody is, you know, when you're marketing your pride, um, we looked at it in a lot of ways. When we market it internally, we try to, we've tried to come up with a big idea that is not just that one weekend. Now, not everybody's is Pride Month is uh, in June like most of the bigger cities, uh, L.A., New York, um, San Francisco. Some are different times of year, but when we do Pride Month, we were trying to come up with something that would last throughout the month and brand it. Last year, we came up with this idea of um, the I Am Out campaign, which we came up and talked to our, our chief diversity officer, our executive champion. We had a lot of people invest into this, talking about themselves in a way that you know personalized it gave a reason to say I am out, especially with the environment we've been in politically. We can't be political, but this is just saying why, another way of saying I'm proud and out because. Uh, we got great social uh, feedback on this across the board. Um, it, it amplified through every social platform. And again, we got buy-in from people. When you say I am, uh, you know, I am out, it became people who are allies saying I'm out for my gay brother or my gay best friend. So um, it really pulled in a lot of people that you wouldn't necessarily always expect. Um, so that being said, saying that it, Pride is more than just a weekend for the whole month, we actually looked at it holistically last year. Um, we had a little bit of a challenge in LA where our Pride became a march, uh, so we didn't have a parade as such that had any sort of corporate sponsors in it. Um, had we it had been a regular march, we would have been in it. However, we did look at it in other terms, like what business units can we work with? How do we involve internally with our folks and market this month to them? So as you can see on our schedule, um, we had uh, buy-in from our one division of Focus Features that uh, helped us work a screening with Outfest, our uh, Outfest Film Festival to do a free screening of Milk. We did the first ever LGBT night at Universal Studios Hollywood, which again, our person went on our team and presented a great business case to them that they said, okay, yeah, we see value in this. Um, and again, we came back with a few other pieces here. The Beguiled was another piece that um, we were able to offer our internal folks through Focus Features. We did a clothing drive for a community aspect. Like Kristen said, we look at everything from a 4C model standpoint. And then the last piece of that, the LGBT, LGBT family picnic, 
usually our pride has got a lot of uh, family involvement in it. And because we didn't have a parade last year, we said we need to do something so that our folks can bring their kids and have a fun time. And it, it, one of our C's is culture. So it promotes a great positive culture within the company. And again, our folks, our business units, all look at it as it's value added and it's very important to continue doing these things. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Chris in a little bit to talk about how we develop an external message right now on this. Yeah, as Mike said, um, it's really important to speak with the different business units. Over here, we're, we make sure to speak with all of our business units, all the marketing heads, to identify what the marketing priorities are at any given time. As you know, with all of your businesses, it can shift. And depending upon um, where, where priorities fall, it may or may not make sense to promote something at Pride. So we're hope, you know, this year, or actually last year, it was a perfect window for Will and Grace. That was something that NBC Entertainment was pushing out, um, and it fell perfectly within the Pride windows, and there was a huge national push that uh, promoting Will and Grace through all the Pride activations. So we make sure we speak with our various uh, business units Here's an example of a page from a deck that we sent out a few years ago to show our marketing partners the various values that we can bring in, or, in order to promote their priorities. So this was specific to the LA Pride Parade. So we, um, we mentioned you know, how many impressions there are, you know, what are the opportunities, like um, you know, specific signage, we can integrate your talent. Um, our employees can act as a free street team if they want to distribute merchandise. We have vehicles in, in the Los Angeles Pride Parade. We're extremely branded, and we bring a tram from the Universal Theme Park into the parade. Um, but in the past, we've brought golf carts and, and picture cars like convertibles, and we've branded them based on whatever business unit is wanting to be involved and if they have a very specific message that they want promoted out to all the parade goers. One of the things I'd like to add to what Kristen just said, as she said, this is a couple years old. What was nice about it is when we first started doing this, we had to go into our business units and let them underst help them understand what we could do in terms of getting into these environments. We are lucky and fortunate enough now that they understand what we do and they actually start looking at their calendars and they've started coming to us and going, oh, we know Pride is this month, what can we do? And it's an amazing collaboration because um, I know that, that we've got all over the country, we're now talking to all of our other locations and saying, okay, what can we do in a lot of places? Go back to our marketing partners internally and say, it, can't, it doesn't have to just be LA. We can spread this out. And for them, they look at it and go, wow, that's a really big impact rather than just one market. Yeah, and it's important to, to make the message, you know, here is what we can do for you. Here's how we can amplify your message, not just what can you give us, what can you do for us. And that really helps with the business purpose of Pride. And then when we, we look at the internal part of this as well, you know, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with Pride festivals across the nation and that special joy of the hurry up and wait as everyone gets ready for something, the event to start, the festival to be open, or that long wait for the parade step off. Inevitably, there's always two groups. There's those who have the look of being totally annoyed, confused, hot, thirsty, wondering why they woke up early and not be able to find a parking spot or find their people or not knowing what to do, and those who are actually enjoying themselves and excited to be a part of Pride. The difference? Every bit of planning and every bit of detail that goes into it. So as Joe said, it's the planning on our end for our internal folks to make sure that they are getting the best experience. Um, we actually really have come up with a, a system that, that does everything. We make sure that our communications go out in a timely manner. We make sure that when we have the communications go out, it's everything from a save the date to recruitment emails for volunteers for the day of. We have a great check-in system with our folks and everybody's friendly. We do have lines sometimes because everybody shows up at once, but because everybody's smiling and having a good time, it's a really well planned out and well thought out experience for that person coming. So you don't have that person start 
literally checking out, as Joe said, the second that they walk in and going, why am I here at 10 a.m. on a Sunday morning when they've been out part, you know, the night before? And again, all of these pieces have every little detail you can think of, time, location, parking, how to get there by public transport. Is there something at the end? Um, and the little things that you would probably not always think of, but like helpful hints as sunscreen, good shoes, um, not bringing your bags so you don't have to take something. It's, it's just well thought out, so it seems meticulous. Once you do it once or twice, it becomes turnkey for future people leading that parade. And your uh, attendees really love coming back year after year then. Um, with that being said, I'm going to talk, I'm going to hand it over to, to Kristen real quick, talk a little bit about what we do, what else we do day of uh, that makes it special. Yeah, so one of the things that, um, as Mike said, we really want to make sure everybody kind of understands that why they're there and has a good experience. We want people to come away with a very positive experience. So some things that we do is we provide brunch before um, before the parade. Folks are going to be walking for a couple of miles, um, and, and in Los Angeles, we never know exactly when our step-off time is. So it's a way not only to kind of get people there early and actually um, together, uh, but it's also a way to make sure everybody is safe and doesn't, uh, you know, faint from heat and no food and water. So we make sure that they are hydrated, that they are fed. Um, we do have a, a bar. Typically in the past we've had a bar that's open for um, adults to purchase their own. Um, we don't provide uh, beverages uh, or alcoholic beverages, but folks can uh, buy them on their own. I know that's an issue for some companies. For ours, it isn't because they're they're purchasing on their own. Um, a lot of folks bring their families, uh, so there are children, and so we make sure that there are activities for those children, like face painters. Um, we are fortunate to have uh, you know Universal Parks uh, come down, and they'll bring um, they'll bring some of their employees with with various activities for the kids. Um, and we encourage this whole time, we use it as a major social media plug. We encourage pictures. We, we make sure everybody knows our hashtag, hashtag PrideMBCU. Um, and we ask them to push it out on social media. So many times that's when the majority of photos are actually posted is in this waiting period. But it's all branded because everybody's in their t-shirts and, and you see the signage. And it's actually a really great time um, to get that message out. And then for our post parade, um, once everybody has gone through the parade, we often will provide a space for them to just congregate at the end for maybe like an hour before everybody goes off and enjoys the rest of their pride. Yeah, and Kristen, this is Derek. So just really kind of dovetailing off of what you said, we Comcast have done the same thing where you know we've had that that pre pride brunch, which is a great way for um, you know our volunteers to help organize the t-shirts and the hats and some of the signage that, that we want, you know, everyone to hold during the parade. Uh, but it's also a great, great time, a great opportunity for everyone to meet family, friends, and, you know, we've had, like, our, our executive vice president of HR present at the events to, you know, talk to, talk to the pride goers and really kind of great opportunity to meet everyone and, and get a little bit of different perspective. So, so it's, it's a nice, nice time before the, uh, the pride. And if we, we take a step back to the business case of the whole thing that, that we've kind of been peppering through, the, through this, there was a, a question that came up around how do you build that business case. Um, one of the things I would recommend for that is there is a tremendous amount of research that's readily available. Uh, sometimes you need to commission a little more or find something a little more specific, but there is a lot of information that's available, a lot of data. Um, data is what's, you know, data is the key. Data is what's going to get the attention of your executives and um, the insights that come through that. One of the things that we do for a number of our LGBT clients is just that. Keep a, a thumb on the pulse of what's going on and be able to drive those insights and share those insights with our clients so that we, we help to build that internal business case. So it's, it's not an easy task, but it's something that, that building that and building that support for that is something that, that has to do. And if we take a step back for a moment, it's also important to recognize that pride you know, can and, and should be part of an overall strategy of how to engage this segment. Um, you know, if you think about it, it's a very quick window to see a, a parade contingency walk past you on the parade. You know, if you're a participant in the parade or take a moment to stop at a booth or a, a booth at the festival or at the event. Um, 
you know, as an ERG, having an understanding of this and being the internal advocate for this really help, you know, really does help build value for your, your, your ERG. Um, you know, not every brand or, or, or company has the resources or ability to create this, you know, what I refer to as the surround sound approach to the segment. But taking a look at some of this, it's worth a discussion with your planning teams to talk about how can we expand the reach of your efforts? How can we do a little bit more with this? How can we just take that audience and make it a little bit bigger than, than what we're doing, you know, on site for a couple of angle, or, you know, a couple of hours? You know, is there a PR angle to the plan? Um, is there a VIP event with, you know, a week ahead of time that key executives and stakeholders can come to. You know, can we use Pride Month as a way to, to showcase an employee story online, either internally or externally? You know, is there a budget to do a highly targeted paid social campaign just to promote your participation in the event? Facebook is, you can target so carefully with that, uh, and for not a lot of money, really increase the reach of what you're doing and the awareness of what you're doing. There's a ton, a ton to think about and a ton to get creative with, and it just really is important that now is the time you have those conversations as you're starting your, your planning process. Um, in terms of the, the day of considerations, um, if your company is inclined, and I hope they are, there's a really easy way, as we've, you know, others have talked about, is to extend the reach by encouraging people, your participants, to use their, their personal social media channels. That said, put some guardrails on it and communicate that ahead of time. Use the approved hashtags, the Pride NBC you, Kristen, talked about. Talk about what makes an appropriate photo, what doesn't, what comments we don't want to see, what photos we want to see, all of those things. And then make sure you have someone on your team who's assigned to monitoring those channels um, so you have the likes and the retweets and all boosting that presence. And then we're going to take a quick look at a couple of case studies. Um, Nothing too in-depth, but enough to give you a little flavor of some of the things that we've worked on. All right, so Derek speaking here. So 2016 Pride was, you know, we, we did Pride before 2016, but, but never like, you know, the kind of coordinated event we had in 2016 and going forward from that point. So between our, our out at Comcast ERG and, and external agencies, we – we wanted to make it a huge showcase event. So we, we picked four markets where we were going to really, quote, unquote, kind of go all out and, and help kind of create like a, a repeatable, you know, kind of turnkey process that we can kind of carbon copy to other markets. Um, but it was a great way that helped kind of bridge the internal alignment between our, our senior leadership and, you know, kind of showing that business case and, and help building like a huge volunteer base that we can tap into year after year. Um, so again, we did have those four showcase markets that we repeated to six other markets. So we had a total of 10 um, that first year in 2016. You know, we had a great um, planning structure where we had the signage coordinated. We engaged our internal marketing um, for the actual, you know, the branding and, and, and visuals, um, you know, what kind of signage we had. So they, they helped us kind of create all that, but it was a great way to kind of centralize the management um, for Pride, um, you know, get roles, committees assigned, um, but then also kind of after the event, you know, we, we did deep dives and we talked to our ERGs, our other volunteers, and find out what kind of really worked well, what didn't, and then put that into planning that went into our 2017 um, Pride planning at the end of 2016. But really, you know, with, you know, the floats that we had in some markets, the um, branding that we had, the signage, um, you could see there in the one picture that we, you know, we some of the after events, the Pride Pride Fest, we had a step and repeat, uh, face painting, things like that, that really kind of engaged uh, the marchers, the volunteers, and things that were just really, really fun. Um, so, you know, great, great way to kind of get everyone kind of, you know, behind the uh, the Pride the Pride wagon. And I'll just add to that from an agency perspective. So the goal in that from, um, you know, as, as part of the agency was to uh, look at all of these markets um, as, a, as, a, as a common place and how do we create a template um, as a form of execution that could be replicated uh, and, and executed in several markets without having to recreate the wheel each time. So allowing both the participants across ERG hubs but driving that consistency as well. Because what we found is that sometimes with hubs all over the country, it's tough to pull it together with one effort, one message, uh, and drive that consistency. And so our, our goal in those four showcase markets were to develop a template that was 
completely repeatable across the other markets as they moved into 2017. Yeah, and, and, and Derek speaking here too. So that really helped us move in 2017. We had 10, 10 markets in, in 2016. We had 17 in 2017, which was for Comcast, you know, being more new to this than the NBC side of the house is, is huge. Um, again, you know, great ERG engagement and input, um, especially with the signage. So some of the signage and visuals we had in 2016, you know, we found out at least, you know, from, from our volunteers that they were hard to read. So we, we took that feedback. We created better, better signage on the shirts, better, better visuals, better um, banners, um, things like that, that went into 2017 and, you know, overall a better experience. So um, making sure that we had the hashtags, um, the messages, and some of the marketing campaigns like the Save Pride, which was really geared to our, our, um, our, our voice remote that we were promoting at the time, where you could say Pride into the remote and it would automatically kind of pull up all the um, LGBT related content. Um, so that's some of the things that we were you know, kind of getting into our message for 2017. But really kind of the takeaway was, you know, moving to 17 markets, again, like Joe mentioned before, it's hard to kind of corral, you know, different leaders in, in Seattle and Portland and kind of all across the country. But really showing the benefit by centralizing that, having one person be the point of contact to work with the vendors to get the bigger discounts and make sure the shirts look exactly the same in each market, the walking banner looks exactly the same in each market, and that message is consistent across the board. Um, so we were really able to achieve that in 2017 with a lot of markets and a lot of participation and everyone really giving that, that same level of support. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, this is Mike again. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the points that we've been talking here that Derek has mentioned on centralizing things. And on the NBC Universal side, as Kristen had said earlier, um, we've, we work with our business units and we find out what priorities are. This is from a couple of years ago when uh, we had done hairspray and we have another one there, uh, one of our other NBC properties. Um, and last year she said we did Will and Grace. One of the nice things, again, it, it when we do something like this, having that centralized uh, person talking to that business unit, this becomes a little bit more scalable for the smaller markets, the smaller markets that may not have access to the, the big decision makers in larger places. So our thought has always been when we partner with these business units, figure out what their needs are, and we talk to them again, as in the deck we, Kristen had shown before, what is it that we want to do? Is it balloons, T-shirts, you know, street teaming? All of these ideas we give to them, they figure out their budget of what they want to have our folks walk in. And one of the nice things when we do this, like, you know, they provide all of these different things that then we can ship out to different places across the country, which they're very happy that they don't have to deal with 12 different markets. They're dealing with one person and they're just shipping it out to these teams. On this slide, as you can see, what's great about it then is it becomes a very branded presence for these folks. Um, LA and New York, we probably have about 400 to 500 people in each market walking. Um, those balloons on the top left, those were three-foot round balloons, and we had 100 of them. And when you walk down a street with 100 three-foot round balloons, your internal <laughs> people can't be any happier with that presence that you just provided them. I mean, we are in LA, a, a city block long at least, with, and we also, for Hairspray, had a drag queen dancer and a dance troupe with those great wigs. Again, these are, this went across our entire portfolio of ERG locations so that, as Derek was saying, it is a consistent look that we are presenting as a brand, and not everyone has to rethink the wheel across it. Um, again, best idea is sometimes just go in there and figure out how you scale them to the different locations because um, not everybody's going to be able to do everything. So, you yeah, know, and that's, that's going to happen. Uh, I would and right now, oh, Joe, is that you? No? Nope. Okay. I'm going to put this back over now. We're going to give a couple of ideas here, a speed round of what's hot and what's not as you are planning out your pride events. 
So Derek, I'm going to hand this first one off to you. All right. So um, what's hot, bold, easy to read logos, and you can see here with the first picture with the Will and Grace campaign. And then, you know, in the second picture, you can see Xfinity with the, the pride treatment, the, the rainbow treatment on the Xfinity. But if you're walking down the street, you could see someone coming towards you from afar, and you could easily recognize, oh, Xfinity, I, I get what that is, or Will and Grace, I'm going I'm to watch that when it comes out in the fall. Um, and I think we learned, you know, especially from 2016, we had, you know, the message and, and the graphics on the shirt were not very easy to read. So that was a takeaway, and we incorporated that into a better 2017 visual experience that you could see here. So what's not hot? Random t-shirts. Everybody in the, in the contingency needs to have the same look. So it's great to you know, have some, some ways for people to customize their looks. Customization encourage, is encouraged, but consistency is the key. So again, going back to the whole business aspect of this, it's a public-facing marketing opportunity. So everyone who's in the group is an ambassador for the brand and needs to be aware of what they're doing, um, what image they are portraying, how they're carrying themselves, uh, all of those things play into it. So anyone uh, who's, who's with you, whether it's, it's uh, at the festival, at the event, uh, in the parade, has to share that consistent look and really know what's going on um, back to some of that organizational piece that we talked about earlier. Joe, Joe what was the technical term for that? Sorry. Was it called zhizhing, right? Zhizhing. That is a technical delay. term, yes. <laughs> we, we do a zhizhing table where we have <laughs> markers and, and, and uh, scissors and everything so people can personalize, yes. And that's actually something to keep in mind when you do create T-shirts, if you do create T-shirts for your company, is to, if you're going to allow your employees to personalize it, make sure your logos are not anywhere where folks are going to cut or tear off. Um, because then it would just be a blank T-shirt and there wouldn't be a point to, to what you've spent your money on. Um, and now uh, signage is just as important. Uh, signage should be uh, consistent. Um, and many, uh, many parades and activations have people walking in extreme heat for you know, up to three miles. Um, so it should be something that's compact, fairly light, not unwieldy, um, and just kind of, uh, you know, safer, frankly. You don't want anything that's going to hit someone. Um, you don't want anything that perhaps has, uh, you know, a, a wood handle where folks can get splinters. Uh, we discourage and don't allow homemade signage in our parade. Uh, we want everything to be consistent. We want everything to be professional. We want, this is really, you know, folks are taking photos in this age of social media. We want our presence to be, um, to be solid, and we don't want anything to kind of be misconstrued in any way. So this is part of uh, us being able to kind of control the image as well. So that rolls perfectly into what else is hot here, the crafted consumer experience. So it's about recognizing that folks that are, are watching you are participating with you. So having, if you're going to do branded items, have them easy to handle, have them easy to make sense, have it something that's not going to just be thrown away and, and end up on the ground and then you've kind of tarnished your brand image. Uh, so we want to make sure that things are, are, are quick and easy and ready to go and make sense for, for what your message is. That idea of the choreographed contingency. So if you see that picture there, um, that was completely planned out as to the walking banner, who's going to be holding it, what, sides, what signs are immediately adjacent to it, what balloons are behind it, what's the next section behind that, who's going to be passing out things behind them, um, because you want people passing out towards the back so people are paying attention to you when you, when you pass the front, not trying to, to get a, a, a set of beads. You want that to happen after they've already seen your message. Little details like that that really play into how everyone um, experiences this. The other thing about signage that's important to remember is signs get heavy, even if they're just uh, made out of foam core. Have a sign bunny, buddy. The last thing you want to have is someone dragging a sign behind them halfway through the parade because they're tired. So we want to pass that off to someone else so we still keep that up and we still keep that professional look all the way through the end of the experience. What's not? The jank factor. We want to avoid jankiness. So 
floats are great, but if it's if the if the budget is isn't there to do it really well, our recommendation is that you don't do it. Do what you can do on the budget you have and do it really well. Another thing that's important is to be well organized. Um, here in Los Angeles, we are very fortunate to have an amazing committee of volunteers, and we utilize that. Um, so we make sure that we have a very organized event playbook for the day and that all of our committee has this playbook and understands it. Understands it. They understand the full scope. Um, we want to make sure everybody on the volunteer side understands who is in charge of what so we assign leaders to each section, and we also, if they don't know, we have point people that they can go to. Um, what this does is it's a trickle-down effect. If they're not worried and they're not running around freaking out, then everybody who is there to enjoy the day will also not be concerned. They will have a much more positive experience. And we want to make sure our employees have a great time and that they're not lost and that they can figure out who to go to very easily if they have questions. If they want to know where the bathroom is, if they want to know when we're going to be stepping off in the parade, if, you know, if they have any questions at all, we want to make sure to make their experience as, as clean, easy, and fun as possible. So on this slide, you'll, you see an example of, our, of a couple pages from our playbook, and we create this with the committee. Uh, you'll see that we know where everything is placed in, in our main, but right now we usually have a parking lot that we'll set everything up in. Uh, we have tables for face painters. We have tables for um, check-in. Uh, we have multiple volunteers at check-in so that we can avoid lines. Um, we have different zones for the parade so that we know uh, zone one is holding the initial signage. Zone two has you know, t 12 balloons assigned, zone three is the dancers, zone, you know, some, and so on and so forth. We want to make sure everybody understands what the official signage is. So if anything seems out of sorts um, and isn't on brand during the day, folks can be able to pull them out immediately. So we know that there's the out at NBC Universal and the Comcast NBC Universal signs as well as any specific business unit signage. We just want to make sure everybody is aware of everything that's happening at, on that day so that nothing seems out of sorts. Uh, and I just wanted to uh, chime in for a second. This is Mike again. Um, this deck that you're looking at, we developed several years ago. And it's, again, this, that thing of we spent one year, we sat down, we really got this thing together. And then the next couple of years, it every year gets a little bit easier because you have this template, this Bible, however your respective area or ERG works, it's there for repeating the next year. So it may seem like a ton of detail, but once that detail is done once, it just becomes so much easier year upon year. And our goal is that this can live beyond um, everybody else. You know, in reality, not everybody stays with the same company all the time, or perhaps their jobs get busier and they can't volunteer anymore. So we want to make sure that the playbook gets passed forward, and so there's never a year where people are having to reinvent the wheel. And what's not is, is all of that negative experience that we're trying to avoid, like I mentioned before. Um, we're just really careful to make sure our volunteers feel supported and that they really understand that big picture because this will allow a better experience for all employees, including their family and friends. Okay. So, Joe. And what's hot? So this is about uh, including company hashtags. It's, ma it's maximizing the impact of the social and digital um, Again, back to that, that idea of giving clear direction to members, uh, your, your participants. Um, we want to encourage use of hashtags that are segment specific, meaning LGBTQ, but not necessarily just for Pride Weekend. We want to, that'll allow for that wider conversation and connection to other events and locations where you may have activity, other hubs around the world. As you kind of see here, um, out Sydney, the out at NBC Universal, Sydney is using the same hashtag to pull in their information as well. So it all becomes part of the same conversation. Uh, at Emory here we use hashtag Emory Culture, which also includes our Spirit Day presence, taking it beyond pride and giving it a more year-round feel. 
And I, I think and also what's not? Oh. oh, sorry. I was just going to add in that yeah. if your company has a dedicated social media team, engaging them early, um, even if you have a designated photographer who's taking pictures, who could pass that stuff along and, and do live posting, that's that's great. Um, that's that's what we've done in, in the past couple of years, and I think it's worked out pretty well. And then, of course, what's not is thinking pride is just a one-and-done weekend. So engaging the LGBTQ segment both internally and externally is not just about a fun weekend or a parade. And what's the big secret? I'll let you know. LGBTQ people exist and spend money all 12 months out of the year, not just in June. Sometimes we forget that. So I encourage um, ERGs to take a leadership role in identifying opportunities for the companies and being a resource for that internal external communication. Think about that surround sound manner that we that I previously talked about, um, and of course, you know, recognizing when things get to a, a point where uh, you need help and, and having that agency support maybe is something that would be a, a good next step for you. And finally, Derek. Yeah, it's it's not an easy job. It's it's a lot of work to do. Um, it's a lot to balance your your gay job versus your day job. Um, so, in, with respect to planning, you really really have to start that early in the year. Um, engage the right leadership, um, setting expectations with your own management that hey, you know, come come May and June, you know, I I may have a lot of work to do here for Pride, especially if if you're the one who's going to be the coordinator or the, the project manager for, for your specific pride. Um, but, but know that, hey, you, you can't do it all. You're going to burn out. Make sure that you get help and, you know, tap into your ERG and, and volunteer base to help with, you know, the coordination, the planning, um, you know, the, the visuals, et cetera, because it really, really, really is a lot of work to do, um, and you can't do it all yourself. Great, and now we have uh, some time for q and A. I I know folks have a lot of questions out there, so um, hopefully we can answer all of them. Um, Thank you, Kristen. I, I'll, I'll reach out some questions. I think, number one, I'll address the first question just to get it off the bat. The, the most popular question we received is, uh, will the slide deck be available after the call? And so we will share that as a recording with everyone, so no need to, to worry if you missed all the notes. Uh, but in the meantime, yes, we have some great, great uh, questions. One came in a little bit earlier, and so, so this might, might refer to something from the beginning of the slides, but can you please reframe what the four C's were? Yeah, not a problem. The four C's are commerce, culture, community, and career. Awesome. Thank you. And let me see here. Um, I'm interested in hearing from, from the panelists, this is a question that came in from the group, on what, what you feel about exclusivity or potential exclusivity in a pride parade. Do you require that the event not allow other corporate sponsors from your same business sector, for example? I think that uh, this is Joe um, from Emory. I think that's a tough one. Um, exclusivity in any sponsorship or any participation uh, is something that's negotiated. It's something that you have to have a, uh, you know, a conversation with the organizers about. That being said, that's not something that comes cheap. So if you if that's something that's really important to you, recognize that there's going to be a a large budget attached to that in most cases. Um, otherwise, quite honestly, I don't know that it's it's that big of a deal that there are you know, a couple of different brands in, this, in the same parade that all have their own messages and their own unique approach to things. Exclusivity is possible in some cases, but it is not uh, an inexpensive thing in most cases. All right. This is Mike again. I, I would think that when you're talking something exclusivity, you're talking like a, a general sponsor of the actual event. For, for us, we go in as ERG contingents. So we're not necessarily looking for that exclusivity. I mean, we do have our other entertainment brands that you know we compete with, like ABC uh, out here and, and, and Disney in, in LA. So um, honestly, I, we actually, my whole team looks at the other team, and I know they look at ours, and it's a competitive thing. We, we, we kind of makes us get better. So I kind of like that. 
Yeah, I think also from the Comcast perspective, so, you know, our competitors would be like Verizon or AT&T, but we, we also enjoy that, and, and I think it, it's it's nice for us to see that our other, other um, you know, competitors are also out there supporting Pride as well. Awesome. One question sort of related to this around, around funding. How much of your annual budget or your ERG budget do you allocate? What percent to the day-to-day, -to, -day, uh, to excuse me, to the day of Pride? Or is this separate funding um, versus the annual ERG and then the specific Pride? I'll answer from the out at NBC Universal side. Um, we incorporate our, you know, we, we account for Pride within our, our local ERG budget. Um, but in terms of how much is allocated for Pride, that really just depends on your market and, and what the cost is for Pride. Uh, there are some parades throughout the country that have a very high entrance fee uh, for companies. Other Pride parades, there's, there's no entrance fee. So it really just depends. And perhaps you're in a market that doesn't have a Pride parade and you have a, a smaller festival. So. Um, I wish I could give you a, a better answer on that, but it really just depends on the event. But in terms of where the budget is housed, it's it's at the local level for us. At the local level. And, okay. and this is Derek. I'll answer for Comcast. And it's, uh, I guess the the easiest answer is it's, it's complicated because you know we we're a company that's that's you know made up of, of different divisions and regions. Um, so in some cases, the budget will come from the local ERG budget. Other cases will come from local marketing. And I know in many cases, you know, they're not all the same across the board, so it's hard to get the same look and feel, you know, but, you know, there's ways around that, especially if, if, if there is a specific product that your marketing team wants to promote, you know, getting them to, to, to buy into Pride and is sometimes a way around that. Um, but, you know, overall, it's, it's not an easy thing to manage, but you need to hit the right sweet spot between marketing and, and your ERG budgets, I think is probably the it, best advice. I think that's great advice, and I think the the secret to that is um, getting super creative about it, and knowing where you can find little pockets of money, whether that's from the marketing side, as Derek mentioned, with someone with a new product, or is it through, you know, employee relations, or is it through recruiting? If we can make the pitch that this is a a, a, re a recruiting exercise as well, um, you know, someone potentially has budget to pay for that pre brunch or that after, you know, the the snacks in the morning, just because. That's the investment in making sure that everyone is perky and ready to go and, and is going to have a great time on this to, to really execute on the, the vision of the entire thing. So it does take some creativity, but um, most of the people I work with find a way to make that happen. So, And, and Joe, I'll, I'll just add one more thing to that. Um, you know, one thing I can't stress enough is don't be afraid to ask um, because if you don't ask, you won't receive, um, especially if it is setting up for pride or getting that brunch going or – even, even you know, handouts for your volunteer, like water and stuff like that. You definitely want to have that, but please don't be afraid to ask because usually you will receive in this case. And I, I think that kind of dovetails into the one of the other questions here that was answered from, from John about how do you measure the ROI for pride um, participation. Um, and I, it, it's not an easy thing to measure, but I think in terms of, you know, the pride turnout, how many people come and look at pride, um, the social media retweets and impressions um, that those hashtags that you have make, um, I, I think are great tools in, in helping to show the value of Pride, how many people show up for Pride, and you know that impression your your company, your brand, your marketing campaign is making on everyone that's that's turning out for Pride. Sometimes it helps uh, various marketing uh, teams to see the holistic point of view, like to see. Prides over over uh, the entire country as opposed to just one city, um, and demonstrate like this is how many total you know retweets we got throughout all of the pride celebrations. If one particular business unit, like for example NBC Entertainment last year with Will and Grace, um, if one business unit is sponsoring multiple parades or activations, it's helpful for them to see it on a larger scale rather than just was LA worth it? Was DC worth it? Um, it's it's holistic. And, and I think again, going back to recognizing that Pride is a marketing opportunity, a very public facing marketing opportunity. So you're going to want to think about that ROI as you would anything in your marketing mix. So you know, short of Pride being you know a, again a, an internal 
ERG event that is just for your membership, it is a public facing event. So we want to think about what is that, what, what, how would you measure that as you would measure anything else, um, you know, in your marketing mix, whether it's impressions or tweets or retreats or, or all of those things. And, and from an ERG perspective, that's where you can show that, um, that value to your marketing team and help pull that together and say, here's, here's all the data that shows we have, you know, 50,000 people along the parade route and we're going to get X amount number of posts from the organization and all of those, all of those things that, that go into, you know, the overall picture. Awesome. And we're coming up on time, so I want to ask one or two more questions. Uh, this, this one I think you'll find interesting. So uh, this person wrote in, they are a corporate ERG member, but also on the regional LGBT nonprofit board in their area, which is rural. And so their pride is smaller, but represents people from a larger geographic area. How can they get companies to have a presence at their pride event, given the smaller size in a small, in a small town, rural area type of environment? Uh, the person says they're LGBT folks, feel isolated in that environment and could really use the corporate support. So from, from the other side, from your corporate side, how do you think that, that folks can engage corporations in these smaller markets? That, you know, that's, that's always a challenge um, because most corporations, if they're going to make the investment, want to go where they get the, best, the most bang for the buck. But there is a huge, there is a huge segment of the, of the country that is not in New York or LA or Chicago or Dallas or places where they have big, you know, kind of bigger scale events. Um, you know, putting on the hat of the pride organizer at that point, you know, can you reach out to other ERG members and other in, in network through, through some of the contacts that you have through out and equal and, and make those personal asks. It, it, it's a, it's not an easy thing to do. And I think that, you know, trying to find individuals who can say, I can push this through. I can be the champion inside my company to try and make this happen. And I think and that's finding larger, those, those champions are what's going to – go ahead. Right. Yeah, if you're part of a larger corporation like we are at Comcast NBC Universal, um, the larger markets can also help support the smaller markets. Um, you know, we've, we've got hubs for out at NBC Universal. We have about 10 hubs throughout the country, and they're not all in large cities. Um, or, or larger cities. So any time that you know Los Angeles or New York has you know gets sponsorship or partners with a business, we make sure to include um, the smaller markets like uh, Dallas and Orlando that may not have the same um, numbers or the same access. And that way we can kind of help make sure that there's a presence at their parades or their festivals as well. And, and Derek speaking to also from Comcast, I think we even have more of a challenge because we have a lot of small markets across the, across the U.S. in our footprint. Um, and one of the kind of taking a reverse uh, approach, you know, from a minimum perspective, I put together like a minimum package of, of signage, which includes signage, walking banner shirts, um, you know, visual signs um, that that market would probably need to have to have a, 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 a good show for that, that, that pride parade. Um, they may not have taken like all the handouts or all the hats or, you know, some of the extras, but there's like a bare minimum, which, you know, is probably at the price point that that ERG in that market could probably afford, uh, which allows them to participate and get that employee experience and, you know, that, that participation in their local pride. Excellent. Thank you so much. And so we have a couple of other questions that I'll, I'll share with our speakers offline since we're coming up on time. But just want to thank all of you for joining us, um, folks from Comcast, NBC, Universal, Emory. If you have any, any final thoughts, I, I turn it over to you uh, for, for conclusion. Thank you, everyone, for, for listening and participating. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, I and I'll just ask – oh, go ahead. No, nope, I was just going to say I think that, that Pride is a really, I think moving forward, uh, 2018 is going to be a really exciting year across the country, and people are really kind of hungry for that, that sense of community, and it's a great opportunity for everyone's involvement. And certainly if there are additional questions, um, Isabel will be providing contact information, and don't hesitate to reach out uh, as well. 
thank you everyone. And I'll ask our speakers to just remain on the line for, for a second um, and hope to see everyone at our next virtual summit webinar on Thursday, March 15th. And please note that the time is 11 a.m. Uh, rather than noon, so it will be an hour earlier. Thank you all.